Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we only have, counting today, we only have 13 days before the Passover. It seems like time is just flying by. Uh, but it's a special time in the plan of God. It's a special time in our lives. All of those who follow Jesus Christ, you know, this is very special. Uh, God set days apart for us to keep. I didn't use the word that Christians will be keeping it because there's so many Christians that don't even keep the Passover. They don't know what time to keep it, when to keep it. They don't understand God's plan. Um, when God started this with the Israelites, there was no Gregorian calendar, no Julian calendar, none of the calendars that the different religions, religions and different nationalities have today. Let's turn to, to Leviticus 23. We always turn there to start things off of the holy season. We'll read it for a few verses. In verse 1, this is God speaking to Moses. He says, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feast, the appointed feast of the Lord, the appointed feast of God, which you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies, as special times, sacred assemblies. He goes on to mention uh, keeping the Sabbath. In verse 3, he says, There are six days when you may work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly. Sometimes we don't think that meeting here on the Sabbath is a sacred assembly, but it is. You are not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. Verse 4, these are the Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at the appointed times. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight or at sundown on the 14th day of the first month. Most of the world doesn't even know what is the first month on the Hebrew calendar. So there's no way they're going to follow it at the specific time that God says to do it. Let's turn to uh, Exodus 12. Exodus chapter 12. It begins to tell a story of the first Passover and how the Israelites prepared you know, to keep the Passover. In verse 1 it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be to you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man should take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. I'm reading this out of the New International Version because it's a little easier to read. It says, the animals you choose must be a year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the first month, the day of the Passover, where all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight or at sundown. Then they ought to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the doorposts of the houses where they eat the lambs. This same night, you ought to eat of the meat, of, of the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. No leavening. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, the head, the legs, and the inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are supposed to eat it, with your cloak tucked in your belt and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand, ready to go and eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And on that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, 
and I will bring judgment on all the gods of, of Egypt. I'm going to punish Egypt because they have foreign gods. Said, I am the Lord. Uh, I am the Lord. Uh, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So we see that God gives them explicit directions on keeping uh, the Passover, um, showing how, how a Passover is to be kept. It said, verse 14, it said, This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast, no leavening. On the first day remove the yeast from your houses, for whoever eats anything with yeast or with leavening in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day hold a sacred assembly, a Sabbath, special Sabbath, and another one on the, se on another on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generations to come. In the first month you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 20th, 21st day. For seven days no yeast shall be found in your houses, and whoever eats anything with yeast it must, be, must be cut off from the community of Israel. Whether he, whether he is an alien or a native born, eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, must be un, wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. So God has given us instructions that we must deliver in our homes, our property, you know, our houses, our cars, garages. You know, we have crumbs and this stuff almost all through the house if you're not, you know, particular about where you eat. Especially in the living room in front of the TV or whatever. Mm -hmm. God wants us to clean all that leavening out and get it out. And if you're new to this, uh, you know, you've never kept the days of unleavened bread before, you might want to ask one of the members here to, to help you, to, uh, you know, de-leaven your house. The eleven, the eleven, your property. But I want to talk about uh, the spiritual side of the Passover. I want to talk about repentance. Let's turn to First Corinthians. First Corinthians, uh, beginning in chapter eleven. This is a familiar scripture to all of us, especially this time of the year. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28. It says, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment to himself. So God is telling us that we, we need to examine ourselves. And now is the time for us to begin that if we hadn't begun it before. We need to examine ourselves and evaluate you know, our lives and where we are and how do we keep God's commandments. God wants to, us to stop and pay special attention to the relationship that we have with him. Before we receive those symbols, before we receive the bread and the wine, which symbolize the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, he doesn't want us to take it in an unworthy manner. You know, which means not being nonchalant about it, not uh, counting the cost, not being indifferent, or not reflecting in our relationship with Him. It's a serious situation. God wants us to be sure that we evaluate ourselves and uh, make changes in our life. God wants us to have a, repent a repentant attitude. In fact, the very first word that God used when he started his ministry, when Jesus Christ began his ministry, he said, repent. The very first word. For the kingdom of heaven is near. That's in Matthew 4, 17. We won't turn there, but that's the first word he used is to repent. 
And John the Baptist did the same thing, repent. So in today's message, I want to uh, give a definition for repentance and why it's so important uh, that we show repentance and that re uh, repentance is required for salvation. Repentance is one of the doctrines of the Church of God. We'll find out again in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. This is the first of the six doctrines of the Church of God. Hebrews chapter 6. Repentance is listed first because it is the first thing that we need to do when we begin a relationship with God. We have to repent before we do anything else. And God gives us uh, a bit of His Spirit so that we can repent. When we begin to know Him, God reveals Himself to us. He gives His Spirit to us so we're able to accomplish it. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 he says, therefore, uh, therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. God doesn't want us to stay on the same path that we're on because that leads to death. We need to make changes. We need to go in another direction. God wants us to, to have a close, intimate relationship with Him. And again we, again, we can't do that on our own. We can't repent on our own. God gives us a portion of His Spirit that we can repent. Let's turn to John 6.44. These are all basic foundational scriptures. John 6 verse 44. This is one of Mr. Armstrong's favorite scriptures. He used to say it all the time on the programs. No one can come, come to me unless the, talking about coming to Christ, no one can come, come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We cannot come to Christ on our own. We have to be, it has to be done through God the Father. God the Father draws uh, Christ to us. And that's why we're able to repent, because Jesus is beginning to work with us. Let's turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts 11. And in verse 18, when they heard this, they had no further objection than praise God, saying, So then God had granted even the Gentiles repentance. God grants us repentance. Not only the Israelites, but the Gentiles. God allows all mankind to have the opportunity to repent, if He so desires, if, if He calls them to repentance. Doesn't make any difference what nationality you are. God grants us repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think the King James says that God gives us an earnest portion of His, His Spirit. Here it says in five, verse 5, Now is God who has made us made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. That Holy Spirit is the motivating force that allows us to come to repentance. So what is repentance? Is it necessary for salvation? Sometimes, to give a definition of a word, sometimes we ought to say, what is not repentance? 
that would help us to, to understand a little bit. Repentance is not just being sorry for what you've done. Well, there's a lot of different uh, religious groups who think that uh, repentance is just being sorry. I'm sorry, and they feel like they've repented. But repentance is a whole lot more involved than that. Just being sorry is not sufficient. Um, we need godly sorrow. Sorrow. Let's turn a few pages to Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven and verse eight. Say, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, and he's talking about the letter that he had written. This is Paul speaking. This is the letter that he wrote, 1 Corinthians. He says, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, though I did regret it. I, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. And yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Just being sorry, like I said, doesn't cut it. Uh, you have to have godly sorrow, which leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. And Acts chapter 3 and verse 9. Acts chapter 3, and not mine, is in verse 19. Acts 3, 19. It says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that time the refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ. Repent and turn to God so that your sins can be blotted out. Uh, where there's no, no record of your sin. God forgives it and you have a new start. In Acts chapter 5, a few pages over. Acts chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse uh, 25. It said, Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people, talking about the apostles. He said, at that the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. And they did not use force because they were feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin, like our Senate, to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, speaking about in Jesus' name. We gave you strict orders not to speak in his name. You have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and other, other apostles replied, he said, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you have killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness to the sins of Israel. We are witnesses of these things. We saw it. We know it happened. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey, who obey him. So that's a key too. If, if we obey God, God will give us his spirit. And his spirit is the thing that motivates us you know, to do what is right. Repentance is not just a matter of uh, repenting of what you have done, but repenting of what you are. It goes deeper than just the, the fact that you sinned, but repenting of what you are is important. In Romans ch chapter 8, 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. The King James says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be, so that they who are in the flesh cannot please God. Then our natural mind uh, is against God. If we don't have God's spirit to change it, then it's impossible to please God. The NIV says, beginning in verse 6, he said, The mind of a sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. If we're just going with the flow, then we're not pleasing God. There's no way we can please God. Our human mind is incapable of pleasing God. We have to make changes. We must overcome our human nature. Let's turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Reading verses 8 through 14. John is speaking to the crowd. He said, Produce fruit in keeping for re with repentance. When you just feel sorry, there is no fruit of repentance. He said, You must produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourself that we have Abraham as our father. You know, it's not who you know that is going to bring you through. Uh, who you know doesn't make any difference. So if I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already to the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. If we don't produce good fruit we may end up in the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. And John answered it. He said the man with two tunics shall share with him who has none. And the one who has food should do the same, showing that we must share of the abundance that we have. We have to be giving and generous with others. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and he said, Teacher, what should we do? He said, Don't collect any more than you're required to. Soldiers came by and asked what they should do. Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Don't always be grabbing for more. You know, sometimes uh, when we're making deals with other people or buying a car, or we, we try to buy something from someone else, we try to jew them down, and uh, we, want, we want to benefit every time we go into a transaction. That's not the way to be. I'm not saying you don't make a good deal, but don't always be trying to to beat the individual you're buying from out of, out of a chance to make a profit. And sometimes the, the person who's selling is selling because they need it. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people uh, do everything they can to try to squeeze out every penny in their favor. That's not the attitude to have. Don't, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Romans 2 verse 4, we won't turn there, but it says, Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, his tolerance, his patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads to repentance? That's one of the avenues that help us with repentance is God's kindness. Another in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 9. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I'll tell you what, I'm glad that God is patient and long-suffering and kind. 
You know, if God gives us what we deserve, we wouldn't last very long. God is very patient with us. And what a blessing that is. And we need to be patient with others. Let's turn back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we'll begin reading in verse 22. This is Peter speaking to the crowds in Jerusalem. He's talking to Jews and he's talking to the people that live around Jerusalem. And he said, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a, 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 a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did among you through him. And as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God was handed over to these individuals. He could have prevented uh, these men getting a hold of Christ, but he chose not to. He said, uh, to you and, uh, and you and the help of the wicked men, talking about the Roman soldiers, he said, he put them, him to death by nailing him to the cross. God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He said, and Peter's saying, David said this about him. It's not a quote, but these are words that David had said it, that Peter is using. He said, I saw the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue's, tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let the Holy One see decay. Jesus Christ's body would not decay in the grave. He said, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. David did not go to heaven. He's still in the grave, and he's waiting for the time when Jesus returns. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. Christ was the one that was going to be placed on that throne. And he said that he had not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God had, God had raised this Jesus to life, and we are the witness of the fact. We are all witnesses to the fact. I, they, they saw this happen. You know, they were witnesses. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. David did not ascend to heaven and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David understood what was taking place. He said, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, that, said to Peter and the other apostles, What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent first and then be baptized. The, prom the promise is for you and your children. And for all who are off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 people that day. 3,000 people came to repentance and were baptized. We could say that when this happened, the first stone 
was placed in the foundation of repentance, the foundation of Jesus Christ and the kingdom. A first stone is repentance that was placed in the, in the, uh, in the foundation. Again, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 11, 28. We're going to start this time in verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread of, and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, sometimes we feel like we, we're afraid to, to participate in the Passover because we feel like we're unworthy. And we are. We're all unworthy. But that's not what this means. We, we need to come before Jesus Christ and take of the symbols. It has nothing to do with whether you're worthy to take it. We're all unworthy to take it. But God tells us that we should. It's, but you need to consider and examine yourself before you decide to take it. It's not a come as you are situation. He wants to better you. He wants you to uh, make changes. Repent before coming to accept those symbols. He said, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognition, recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment to himself. You know, there's no human being who is perfect. We all need to repent. We all need to make changes. A few sermons, a few messages ago, I, I spoke about uh, is God in control? And I used the example of Job, who was the most righteous individual at that point in time in history. And God allowed Satan to place trials on Job, killing all his his. Uh, family, his children, taking all his possessions. Only his life, his wife uh, didn't didn't die, and uh, he lost all his possessions. And then another trial came after that, and you know, just one thing after another. And yet, Job did not curse God. Uh, he went through those trials, and uh, he still had faith in God. But God addressed the problem that he had, which was self-righteousness. And when Job was able to see that, he repented of that. I want to talk, and, uh, and like I said, Job was the, the most righteous man of his time. Uh, I want to use another example of another man, uh, talking about David. David was never considered a righteous man. He was the greatest man who was living in the, in the world at that time. He was a mighty king, very popular. He did many righteous things, many right things, but he made a lot of mistakes. But he repented of those mistakes. I want to go through Psalms chapter 51. Psalm chapter 51. A fantastic example that we need to consider as we prepare for taking the Passover. We need to go through this and put ourselves in these in these uh, different uh, uh, examples. At the top in the heading, it says, "A Psalm of David." When the prophet Nathan came after him. Uh, came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. If you want to read that uh, section of Scripture, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 12. We don't have time to go through that. But uh, you can read the story in uh, first, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, where Nathan goes and uh, confronts David. Verse 1, the first thing David said, have mercy. The first, he threw himself on 
on, uh, on God saying, I want your mercy. I know I've sinned. I'm guilty. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, make it look like that, uh, you know, I'm self-righteous and uh, I didn't really do all that bad. He didn't have that approach at all. No excuses, just true, heartfelt honesty. I'm going to put some of my own words in this thing as we read through it. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. I, David realized that God, uh, that love covers a multitude of sins. And he knew that God was a God of love. And that God was a very compassionate God. And he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. You know, if there's a record of what I've done, I want you to tear it up. And like the judges said to David, they're going to expunge it. Tear it up, and it's never happened. That's what David was asking God to do. Make it be like it never happened. But wash, all, wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from sin. I want to be renewed. I'll take everything that I've ever done wrong away. And I know my transgressions and my sins are always before me. I can't sleep at night. They're before my eyes. That's all I think about day and night. My transgressions. They're ever before me. I can't get away from them. Against, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We don't sin against one another. We sin against God. He said, so that you are proved right when you speak and you're, ju you're justified when you judge. Surely I am sinful at birth. I've been wicked since the day I was born. You know, I've, I've never been a righteous individual. I, I, I was mischievous. I got into all kinds of things that I shouldn't have got into. You know, we could say that of ourselves. We got into things that we shouldn't have. Surely your desire, you desire truth in the inner part. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean, even though it was harsh. Clean me with hyssop. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, and let the bones you've crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. We don't want no one to know about this. Tear it up. There's no record of, of what I've done. I'm so ashamed. Creating me a pure heart. Don't clean my old heart. Give me a new heart. And renew a steadfast, steadfast spirit within me. Which means that David had a steadfast spirit to begin with. He's asking God to renew it. Say, don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgression, uh, transgressors your ways. I'm going to tell everybody about you and about your ways and about your laws and how good you are and what a wonderful God you are. And sinners will turn back to you and make changes. I'm going to speak to everyone and let them know that you are a loving, merciful God. Save me from, from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves, and my tongue will sing from your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You don't want penance. You don't want me to give up chocolate to help you out. It doesn't do anything to you. I won't give up, you know, anything because you don't want sacrifice. You want obedience. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. If you wanted sacrifice, I'd be more than willing to do it. But I know that's not what you want. 
Help me, great God, to have a contrite spirit. Oh God, you, oh God, you will not despise. In your pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to, the, to delight you, and bulls will be offered to you. Great God, I'm so sorry. I want to put all my sins behind you and under the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want a close, intimate relationship with you. That's what we should be feeling ourselves. Go through this, this psalm and, and read it and meditate on it. You know, this is, this is a, a, just a tremendous example of repentance. Repentance is just the beginning of our relationship with God. David showed godly sorrow. We need to be open to God and to be honest and truthful. You know, bear our souls. Get on our knees and talk to God just like you would be in a room with us. And tell him about all of our problems and our faults, our weaknesses. And ask him to help you overcome it. Ask him to give you his spirit so you can fight things that you never thought that you would be able to overcome. And God will do it. God will give you an opportunity to work on it. We need to be open to God. It's a time of evaluation. And we need to ask honestly, what kind of person am I? You know, how do others see me? Sometimes others see us better than we can see ourselves. You know, sometimes we think we are, we are a little bit further advanced than what we are. Ask how God sees you. Ask God to show you your weaknesses. What do you need to change in life? Apostle Peter said, the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. We're going to have this Passover, like I said, in 13 days. We need to examine ourselves and realize, some, for some of us, it might be the last Passover service that we attend. God is asking us to bear our souls to him. Uh, that we repent and uh, seek him in everything that we do. So as it says in 1 Corinthians, uh, it's time for the evaluation. Let's not take the Passover lightly. Examine yourself before taking the symbols. <laughs>